one of the most powerful things we can do with linear algebra is convert among different expressions, different coordinate systems that describe the same elements within a vector space. After all, a given vector space has many, many different basis that we can use to describe all the elements within it. Generally, infinitely many different bases. And each one of those bases gives us a different way to describe the elements in that set. And one of the things that makes this a challenge is that when we think of even the simplest example of a vector space, like the xy plane, R2, we're very accustomed to describing the elements in R2 implicitly using a very special choice of basis that we call the standard basis. So just for an example, in this diagram here I've indicated two vectors. Here v1 is the vector 2, 1, v2 is the vector 1, 2. Now the thing that I just said, the fact that I said v1 is, is 2, 1 and v2 is 1, 2, what I've really what I'm really doing there is I'm assigning coordinates to v1 and v2. But where do those coordinates actually come from? Like how do we know that v1 is really 2, 1? Why is that a legitimate way to describe this vector, v1? Well, the reason, as we know from high school algebra 1, is that this typical way that we describe coordinates in the xy plane is we'll begin from the origin, and then we'll take a certain number of steps out in the x direction, whatever that means. And in this case, if the x direction goes horizontally, then I need to take a total of one, two steps in the x direction. And that's what this two in the coordinates for v1 indicates. We've taken two steps in the x direction. And we've also taken one step in the y direction. So starting from the origin, I'll go in the y, the vertical direction, up one unit. And the combination of going up one unit together with going to the right two units, if I add those two changes together, I should end up at v1. And that's why it gets the coordinates 2 in the x direction and 1 in the y direction. To put this into a linear algebra context, what we've really done there is we've really taken two vectors. The vector 1, 0, which sort of represents our x direction, and also the vector 0, 1. This vector represents our y direction. And what we've done is we've just expressed v1 as a linear combination of 1, 0 and 0, 1. After all, the arithmetic is pretty straightforward to show that twice the vector 1, 0 added to 1 times the vector 0, 1 gives me exactly the vector 2, 1. But that's just another way of saying that this 2 and this 1 in the coordinate expression for v1 are exactly this 2 and this 1 which are the weights of the linear combination of these two vectors, 1, 0, and 0, 1, that are necessary to produce 2, 1. So what I'm saying is that this 2 is that 2, and that this 1 is that 1. And so this idea of using the weights in a linear combination to stand in as the coordinates in a vector expression that's the key to what's happening in this section. And when it becomes interesting is when we don't use this simple basis, 1, 0, and 0, 1, to express all of our vectors, but when we want to try and convert to use a different basis to determine our coordinate system instead. And so that's what's coming up next. And this becomes a challenging question precisely because this basis is super easy to work with. It's so easy that we even give it a special name. This basis for R2 is called the standard basis. And the vectors that comprise it are typically called E1, so that's the coordinate vector in the first direction, or the x direction, and E2, the coordinate vector, 0, 1, facing in the y direction, or the second orthogonal direction. So this is our standard basis. And the reason the standard basis is awesome is if you hand me the coordinates of some point, let's say this one right here, 5 comma 4, it's very straightforward for me to determine what its coordinates in the standard basis are. If I give the standard basis a name, let me just introduce some notation here, E1, E2 is my standard basis. If I call this basis script letter S, then to come up with the coordinates with respect to the basis S, of the vector 5, 4, what I'm really asking, again, is how do I determine the weights 
in a linear combination of E1 and E2, they're going to add up to 5, 4. So the first coordinate is going to be the weight which I'm attaching to the first basis vector, E1, 1, 0. And the second coordinate is the weight that I need to attach to the second basis vector, one, uh, 0, 1, such that when I add those two together, I get 5, 4. But again, because the standard basis is so simple, because it has a 0 in one of the entries of each ordered pair and a 1 in the other entry, it's pretty easy, I think, to convince yourself that to get 5 in the first entry here, I need to have 5 of my first vector, and it doesn't matter how many of my second vector that I have. So this first coordinate must therefore be a 5. And if that first coordinate here, if the first weight in that linear combination is a 5, that means that the first coordinate in this coordinate vector must be a 5. And for the same reason, the second weight in this linear combination, in order that this linear combination add up to have a second component of 4, that weight had better be, well, it doesn't matter what weight I put here because this has got a 0. And so this 1 right here is going to be doing all the heavy lifting. Putting a weight of 4 next to it is going to make sure that this linear combination adds up to have a 4 in the second entry the way that we want it to. So this basis is called the standard basis exactly because the coordinate vectors agree exactly with the entries in my ordered pair, in my R2. So it's a super easy one to use. It's the one that you've been using your whole life when you've been thinking about coordinates on the xy plane without realizing it. So understanding that you were really using the standard basis all along is a bit like learning how your tongue tastes, right? It's there all the time, but you don't actually think about what it tastes like. Um, and so this is our opportunity to think that really, every time we were talking about coordinates in the xy plane, we were using the standard basis. Every time, that is, until now. Because our next question is how can we understand the coordinates of this same point, 5, 4, in a slightly different way? So to raise the stakes, we're going to change our basis. Instead of thinking about the friendly standard basis vectors, 1, 0, and 0, 1, as forming a basis, and therefore a coordinate system for the xy plane, instead, let's take two other vectors. Remember, that in order to be a basis for a vector space, a set of vectors needs to first of all be linearly independent, and second of all, it has to span the entirety of the space. In the case of the xy plane, we know that there can be at most two linearly independent vectors in any given set, and that if those two vectors are linearly independent, they will span the entirety of R2. So we can also make a basis, for example, out of the vectors v1, which has rectangular coordinates 2, 1, and v2, which has rectangular coordinates 1, 2. If I make the decision to use that as a new basis, then that new basis defines a new coordinate system, a new way of describing locations within the xy plane. And let's see what it would take for us to use that coordinate system to express the coordinates of the same point 5, 4 that we looked at a little bit ago. So the question that we're now ready to ask is, what are the coordinates of 5, 4 with respect not to the standard basis, but with respect to the basis B, having vectors v1 and v2 in it? So it's this different question, but the answer is similar. Because in the same way, the coordinates, by definition, are going to be the weights in whatever linear combination of v1 and v2 is necessary to make 5, 4. Now we know that such a linear combination exists because v1 and v2 span the entirety of the space. We also know that there's only one such linear combination that is ever going to work because v1 and v2 are linearly independent. So we just need to know how many copies of 2, 1 added to how many copies of 1, 2 are going to give me 5, 4. Now we can look at this diagram and just use vector addition and geometry to figure out how to do that using the same intuition you developed in high school algebra 1 for determining points in the traditional way in the xy plane using the standard basis even though you didn't know it at the time. And that traditional way was start from the origin and then begin by taking a certain number of steps in the first direction which in the standard basis was the x-direction, 
but in our new basis is the v1 direction. So if I take some steps in the v1 direction, one step is going to take me to here, a second step is going to take me to here, a third step is going to take me to there, and so forth. So I'm just walking out along the span of v1 however many times I need to. And if at some point I notice that now, beginning to move in the second direction, which used to be the y direction under the standard basis, but now is the v2 direction, if that will get me to where I'm going, then I should do that too. So to get to 5, 4 from the origin, evidently from this diagram, I can take two steps out in the first direction, the v1 direction, followed by one step in the v2 direction, and that will get me exactly to 5, 4. So the hypothesis then is that it will take two copies of my first vector and one copy of the second vector in my basis to combine together in a linear combination of my basis vectors to give me the point 5, 4, which would then mean that the coordinates with respect to the basis B of the point 5, 4 are 2 and 1. Let's verify that that actually works, and then let's look at one more example of doing this conversion when we can't just geometrically sort of walk our way through it and, and reason it out graphically. First of all, the verification shouldn't be too challenging. All we have to do is the arithmetic on the left-hand side. Two copies of the vector 2, 1 are going to give me the vector 4, 2. One copy of the vector 1, 2 gives me naturally 1, 2. And when I add those two together, sure enough, I get 5, 4. The way that I expected. So evidently 2, 1 are indeed the coordinates of 5, 4 with respect to this basis. So how would this look in a more general setting if I don't have a nice friendly picture in front of me? How do I determine the coordinates with respect to a given basis of an element, a given element in a vector space? Let's take a look at an example that's not so straightforward. Say I pick the point negative 3, negative 5. We can see from the picture that it doesn't lie exactly at an intersection of, of lattice lines that are defined by my basis v1 and v2. And so if I'm going to find the coordinates of this vector with respect to the basis b, it's probably not as simple as just counting, because we're probably going to get an approximate answer. So we're stuck with no choice but to try and solve a linear system of equations to determine these coordinates. Because that is what linear combinations, linear systems of equations, are built to do. They're built to determine linear combinations. So how many copies of 2, 1, that's the first coordinate, added to how many copies of 1, 2, that's the second coordinate, does it take to build the point negative 3, negative 5? And so if those two things are unknown, I'm going to give them names. I'm going to call them C1 and C2. And what we immediately recognize on the right-hand side of this uh, equation here is that I have a linear combination of two vectors. And I can represent that linear combination of two vectors as a matrix vector product, the way that we always have. And so the way we'll do that is by making my matrix have as its columns the vectors v1 and v2. So the first column of my matrix is going to be 2, 1, and the second column of my matrix is going to be 1, 2. 2, 1, 1, 2. And then my unknown vector my x vector in this linear equation is going to be the vector that contains my unknown coordinates, c1, c2. And the right-hand side of this equation is going to be negative 3, negative 5. So something you notice here is that the coordinate vector of negative 3, negative 5 with respect to two different bases are appearing in this same equation, related one to another. On the right-hand side of this equation, we have the coordinates of the point negative 3, negative 5 with respect to the standard basis. And on the left-hand side, C1 and C2, these are the coordinates of negative 3, negative 5 with respect to the new basis. So, if we're fortunate enough to have a basis, v1 and v2, if they are linearly independent and if they span r2, that must mean that the matrix, which is comprised of those vectors as the columns, 
has a pivot in every row and a pivot in every column, and it's a square matrix. Therefore, this matrix over here is an invertible matrix. And if we take a look at what's happening in this equation, this matrix, 2, 1, 1, 2, if I call this matrix something, let me call it, well, I suppose I'll call it A. This is a matrix which, when I multiply it by the B coordinates of something, will turn it into the S, the standard coordinates of something. So if you tell me the coordinates with respect to this basis of a point, then just by multiplying by this matrix, I can tell you the standard basis coordinates of that point. After all, that's how matrix vector products work, that the result of a matrix vector product is exactly the linear combination of this many copies of the first column added to this many copies of the second column. And that's, after all, how we defined the coordinates with respect to the basis B in the first place. But in this form, the equation is not that interesting, because it's usually not the case that we're trying to go from a, a weird basis back into the standard basis. Sometimes we are. But it's more frequent that we'd like to know how to go from the standard basis, which we already know a lot about, into the funny basis. And so to do that, we need to get this coordinate vector by itself. And so to do that, because we've convinced ourselves that this matrix is invertible, we'll just multiply both sides of this equation by the inverse of that matrix. And this gives us then a recipe for figuring out the B basis coordinates of any point. To find the B basis coordinates, I just need to find, first of all, the matrix whose columns are my basis vectors, but find its inverse and multiply the standard basis coordinates by that inverse. So the inverse of this matrix A is the matrix which can convert us from standard basis coordinates into B basis coordinates. So we'll just have to do the work to find the inverse of this matrix. I'll use SAGE just to skip a step or two and then multiply by the vector negative 3, negative 5 to give us the B basis coordinates of the point negative 3, negative 5. So if I put the matrix 2, 1, 1, 2 into a SAGE cell and then ask it for A dot inverse, out comes the inverse of this matrix. It does exist as promised. And so all we would have to do is use that matrix multiplied by the standard basis representation the usual coordinate representation of my point, to convert me from standard basis coordinates into B basis coordinates. And when I compute this A inverse times the negative 3, negative 5 matrix product, I get negative 1 third, negative 7 thirds. And that, therefore, is the B basis coordinate representation of my point negative 3, negative 5. And we can check from this picture that that seems like it makes at least a little bit of sense. That if I start from the origin and I go negative one-third steps in the first direction, that means I'm going to go only about a third of the way along this vector v1, going in the opposite direction of v1. And then negative seven-thirds means I'm going to go a little more than two, so two and a third uh, steps in the opposite of the v2 direction. There's one step there's two steps, and there's a third of another step. And sure enough, that gets us to negative 3, negative 5. So the big takeaway from this, if you're looking for a recipe, is that the matrix which has the capability of converting from standard basis coordinates into B basis coordinates is exactly the inverse of the matrix whose columns were the basis vectors B. So if I compute that inverse matrix, I can then use that inverse matrix to determine B basis coordinates for any point. We call this a change of basis matrix for obvious reasons. It gives me the, the ability to go from standard to B basis. And if I invert it, I can go from B basis back to standard basis. That was the original matrix A. So this is the really cool thing, is that every time we define a basis for a vector space, it determines a coordinate system for the whole vector space for us. And these matrices, these change of basis matrices, are how we can convert from one of those coordinate systems into another.